From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Coming up today, K-State's Dan O'Brien will look ahead to next week's USDA Prospective Plantings Report, and he'll comment on a notable development in the grain sorghum basis trends. Among his talking points during his weekly segment on the grain market trends, also today, K-State's Jeff Whitworth will provide an update on insect activity in Kansas wheat and alfalfa right now. Jeff will talk about the declining threat of winter grain mites in wheat, the extent of the concern about army cutworms in wheat and alfalfa, and the current state of weevil feeding in alfalfa. And awaiting to talk Kansas agricultural weather with us, K-State's Mary Knapp, plus more here on Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. This is the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Good to have you along with us on this Friday. To the grain market scene we go now and more gyrations in these trades this past week. That is the norm anymore. Along with us again is Dan O'Brien, grain market economist, K-State Research and Extension, joining us from his office in Colby, northwest Kansas. And Dan, we're going to talk at some length here about that upcoming Perspective plantings report out of the USDA. That's out next week. It's highly anticipated. But before we get specifically to that, we'd have to say that as you look at the markets and you say, especially the carry in the markets, the near term demand is still very much there. Yes. If you look towards the markets as a, I guess, a harbinger or a signaler of, of whether traders or the markets, market overall in its consensus is encouraging people to, to bring grain to market now or to store it. Uh, certainly for all of this year for corn and all of this year and on into next for soybeans, we have no carry in the market. We have, have strong lead contracts. For instance, on yesterday's close, May corn closed at 546, July at 532, September 482, and December at 465. So you got that. And then for soybean futures, May contract $14.14, still tremendous price. July 1404, August 1358, September 1264, the November 1214. So again, no carry whatsoever in those markets. And uh, there are a number of supply demand factors that are affecting that. Again, interplay with South American crop problems and then the finality of, of the soybean crop down there making its way out of the fields to, to the ports and the uh, worries about the second crop planting of corn in, in Brazil, which is their, their export crop. And as I understand, it's about 70, 80 percent of, of the total corn they produce is coming in that second crop. Well, it's been late planted but to some degree. So there's, there's that to think on. Uh, wheat doesn't have the same, same set of issues. Although, you know, wheat's had kind of this mixed bag of things coming at it of late. Uh, of course, the, got some, some moisture, which is good for production prospects or at least brings hope out here in the western part of the state. But you closed yesterday with the May contract, 566 and three quarters in July, up to 573, September 579, and D's to 588. So you do have carry in that. What's always kind of interesting now in the wheat market is, yeah, we have carry that carries right through the next harvest. And from those price levels, uh, probably the first place to go you know, again, in, in anticipation of that prospective planning report, what, what are the futures markets saying in, in terms of the comparison of new crop December corn uh, and, and uh, new crop November soybeans, i.e. the classic soybean corn price ratio? Well, new crop bids, uh, you got 12, 14, three quarters as of yesterday's close for November soybeans, 14.65 and a half for Dees corn. So it's 2.58. That would be advantage soybeans generally. You know, again, two four, two five is kind of thought to be the break even. Advantage soybeans now in that report. And I think the general 
IDF following first what the USDA said, which was about one, one and a half percent more corn, about seven percent more soybeans. And then followed up by other reports, which say closer to three to four percent corn and uh, four, five, six percent soybeans. So that the same things that, that you and I were wondering about before that we'd heard prior to that are, are kind of being reflected, same types of trends being reflected somewhat in these post-USDA Outlook Conference um, surveys. So we shall see, you know, if we have good planting weather, uh, that corn number will probably grow. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, the soybean number will probably grow. Just a matter of of what on the margin gets going in. We will have Uh, clarity on that next week. Yeah. And while we're discussing in-state price ratios here, Dan, you are keeping close tabs on what's happening with wheat bids compared to those for corn. That's tied into this variable that we've been discussing here for some weeks now, and that is the alternative of feeding wheat to cattle as a substitute for corn, given the market alignment that be. When you look at the uh, wheat-corn price ratio in different parts of the state, uh, you and I talked about this before, just on a per bushel basis with 56-pound bushels for corn and 60-pound bushels for wheat, well, in, out in a uh, Colby and Garden City, western part of the state, you've got corn prices greater than wheat prices. And, and uh, so it, in Colby, 555 corn, uh, that's a cash price, 537 wheat. You know, 537 wheat's no slouch of a price, great price, but still it's less than corn. So 97%. You go out to uh, Garden City, uh, even more pronounced. You see uh, 581 corn price and a 544 wheat price, so 94%. And for the rest of the state, Everything else is lined up to be 101 to 103 percent of uh, wheat over corn, but you know from a feedlot owner's situation, if they if they're having difficulty finding corn supplies for what's left that's not accounted for, you probably come back. You can translate that to a per pound basis. Mm-hmm. So you divide those cash prices uh, again: the wheat price by 60 pounds, the corn price by 56, and then see where you stand. And when you do that, then all across the state, the price of wheat on a per pound basis compared to the price of corn on a per pound basis is less. And, uh, of course, most pronounced out, in, again, places we just talked about with the wheat price on a per pound basis being 87% of what corn price is in Garden City, 90% in Colby. And then if you look at the selected locations in Salina, Hutchinson, Topeka, Columbus, ranging, well, basically they're all 94, 95, 96%. This really gives credence then to what you've been saying. There is wheat feeding going on at an appreciable level in Kansas, for sure. And some of that, a good chunk of that will be reflected in the March 1st number. Well, there's been a lot that happened since March 1st. So if anything, the March 1st number is probably going to underrepresent how much wheat feeding has actually happened. So then we go back to this, the supply demand balance sheet that the USDA projected in March 9th in their WASDE report. Well, there's another one coming up in April. So um, it very, very well could be that the number that comes out for wheat feeding in the, in the central and southern plains on March 1st may be expanded upon by the USDA when they come into the April report. Hmm. When the USDA cut back U.S. hard red winter wheat exports by 25 million bushels in, in March, you know, that rather than say that, well, gosh, the sky is falling, a lot of us that live out in this area thought that, well, you know, if it's going into feed usage, it, it, that may explain why there's not as much going out into the export channels because it's being used domestically. So uh, that'll be really an interesting number to look at. And either way, I, I think that you'll aggregate all this together. And I, I would wonder about the U.S. wheat ending stocks number being tightened up some. By the time we actually get to that April WASDE report, that uh, we'll see something below the 836 million bushels that had been projected. And, you know, again, decent exports in a lot of classes, uh, pretty strong wheat feed usage also in, in, in our neck of the woods. That'll help contribute to that. Dan, you say you're finding something curious in grain sorghum basis here in Kansas. Explain, if you would. Well, We've seen grain sorghum basis in some of the major terminals in Kansas uh, weaken here of late. But yet, basis at, at country elevators tending to hold up pretty strong. To me, uh, given the location of those terminal patterns you've seen in the past, where when, we have, uh, when we're filling trains and such, we have strong basis bids, and when we're full, we slow down. 
kind of combine that with looking at what the USDA's grain sorghum export reports are showing the, uh, in terms of their weekly export reports that come out. And uh, you've got grain export shipments at 138.5 million bushels, which is about 47% of the USDA's projection of 295 million bushels. And we're about 55, 56% of the way through the market here. So that's shipments are trailing. Purchases, on the other hand, 84% about of that USDA number of 295 million bushels. Again, we're 56% of the way through. So strong forward purchases trailing shipments. Now, the numbers that matter are ones that we don't have in front of us. How much grain sitting in ships waiting to go? You know, had to get soybeans out of the way first. Something that could very well be the case. But in my thinking, you can't continue to have that that disparity in the grain sorghum market for the long term. Eventually, those forward purchases, almost all of them, I mean, other than just a few bushels, metric tons, as, as the rest of the world sees them, they're all going to China. Mm. So there'll be some times of uh, some barn burner movement coming in the grain sorghum market if these forward purchases hold up. And if they don't, if China reneges or something like that would happen, then the cash price of grain sorghum probably comes to the place it would be considered to meet short-term feed demands while the corn is all in tight hands, et cetera. And I'm not saying that will happen, but the shipments have to start happening or you wonder about that. And and when you see the in some of our major terminal markets, uh, some weakening in, in grain sorghum basis, not all across the state, but in a few key areas, then uh, it just bears watching as to what that might pretend to in the grain sorghum market in the future. We're looking forward to your thoughts coming out of that Perspective Plantings report due out midweek next week when we hear from you next Friday, Dan. Until then, thanks as always. Thanks, Eric. Take care. Dan O'Brien, grain market economist, K-State Research and Extension. He has much more to say about these markets in his weekly notes on the grain trades. You can find those now at agmanager.info, agmanager.info. And Agriculture Today will return in a moment on the K-State Radio Network. A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. We're back now on Agriculture Today, and to get you wheat and alfalfa growers caught up on insect problem potential out there and what to do about that if it's turned up in your stands once more crop entomologist jeff whitworth k-state research and extension tracks that insect activity regularly around the state of kansas we'll start with wheat which is off and growing now has had good rainfall to prompt it along jeff but you are likewise still seeing indications of certain insects getting after it yes the wheat looks to me like it's really taken off as have some of the insects and mites. But usually with the nice weather and the moisture, the wheat in this case can outgrow the damage caused by the insects or mites. And the two insects or mites that I've been called about several times this year already in wheat, first of all, are the winter grain mites. And we always, uh, last fall, I got several calls about winter grain mites because as the name implies, they are winter grain mites. Therefore, They like cool weather or cold weather. Uh, Anytime the temperature is from about 30 degrees to 50 degrees, they can be active, uh, mostly at night. But if it's a cloudy day, they can be active also. The weather, though, has really allowed the wheat to outgrow any of the feeding damage. Uh, In years past, even like last year, when we have a relatively dry winter, fall, winter period, the wheat starts to break dormancy. The winter grain mites start feeding. They scrape the surface and suck the juice out of individual cells. So it takes quite a few little mites to actually show any damage on a wheat plant. But when you couple that with stress due to drought, it can show up quite rapidly and as the temperatures stay cool and the drought proceeds, 
that damage shows up, and I get a lot of calls. This year it started, oh, last November, December, but we started having moisture also. And now once the plants break dormancy, we start worrying a little bit about winter grain mites. While the, while the wheat's still in dormancy, we really don't worry about it because that feeding's not going to cause any problems. And they're generally in dormancy themselves. But in the last you know, couple of weeks, the winter grain mites have been feeding, and there's quite a few of them around in different spots. So the growers have noticed them because they stand out. They have red legs, and they stand out on a green, nice green background of the wheat, of the leaves of the wheat plant. But we've gotten a lot of moisture. So I've not seen any of the typical yellowing or silvering of the leaves as the winter grain mites feed on those individual cells. So I, I really don't think we're going to have to worry about winter grain mites. I mean, we're far enough along now. As the temperatures get, you know, over 50 degrees, 55, 60 degrees during the daytime, the winter grain mites will go into what we call summer dormancy anyway. So uh, I think we're pretty much past I hope that the <laughs> temperatures at the winter grain mites are going to cause any problems. Plus, when you get heavy rains, they wash the mites off anyway. So I, I don't think we're going to have any problems. They may be fading away, but are army cutworms still poised to cause damage yet? You've talked about those before, Jeff. Yes, army cutworms, again, that's one of the very unique insects that we have, period. They uh, will feed in Kansas on just about any grass they'll feed uh, or any plant. The female moth lays eggs in the fall. The eggs hatch, uh, and they generally lay eggs in any grass that's still green, wheat, alfalfa. The female moths will lay eggs, and those larvae hatch out in the fall. They'll do a little bit of feeding, but generally we don't notice it because they're really small. And then in February, March, April, as the alfalfa, in this case, and wheat break dormancy, those larvae start to get larger and larger, and as they get larger, they do more feeding damage. So last year, 2020, was a really good example. We had lots of bare spots show up in fields. Those bare spots then would start getting larger and larger, and oftentimes the growers would see birds out feeding in the field, blackbirds, seagulls, even turkeys. Turkeys are really good at finding army cutworm larvae and feeding on them, but the army cutworms will feed, and if, especially if in the dry conditions, they can severely limit growth on wheat and or alfalfa. If we have good growing conditions, if we have good root systems, it's probably not going to take out a stand, but it's really going to set it back. But this year so far, I've already been out to look at some bare spots in fields where there are army cutworms. Again, we got good moisture this year. So it looks to me like the army cutworms that are there now remember we're early mm -hmm. uh, they still have probably another month of feeding to do and the majority of the feeding yet to do as they get larger uh, and then they'll pupate in mid to late april and then the moths will emerge in mid-may and they'll fly to colorado for the summer then come back in the fall and start to process all over again I do think, though, that unless it's a weak stand of alfalfa or a weak stand of wheat already, I really think the plants will be able to withstand that damage. And the infestation levels I've seen so far this year are not what they were last year anyway. It takes, you know, it depends on the crop and the health of the crop and all that, but four or five cutworms per square foot, something like that. Unless the conditions are good and if it's a good stand of weed, good stand of alfalfa, then it may take seven or eight before you really have to worry about it. And I haven't seen any infestation levels at that level yet. But like I said, they're still early. They're just starting to come out of winter. They're starting to feed. But so far, we've had good weather conditions, and I think our alfalfa and our weed will be able to stay ahead of the winter grain mites and the army cutworm feeding. Well, favorable news so far, but customarily... Looking at alfalfa now, we start talking seriously about weevil threats to those stands. What are you seeing and hearing about to date? Well, the alfalfa weevil is our number one pest, period, in alfalfa. The only saving grace of alfalfa weevils, they're mostly only going to affect the first cutting, but they can severely affect that first right. cutting. And they will uh, actually 
take the first cutting if you don't treat them in many cases throughout the state. So the alfalfa weevil, again, it's a cool weather insect. Uh, it does most of its feeding from between 48, 50 degrees to probably 70, 75 degrees. That's when they're most active. They're, mo- they're, they're most active during the cooler part of the day and at night for the most part. The thing with the alfalfa weevil, the adult weevils, they move to the fields in the fall and they start laying eggs. And they'll lay eggs anytime the temperature's over about 48 to 50 degrees all winter, January, February, March. And we've had several spells last winter of warmer temperatures. So there has been some egg laying going on and some insect development, some larval development. But we're starting to see eggs hatching. So the easiest way to start finding alfalfa weevils, at least in my opinion, is to go out and look for little pinprick size holes in the leaves or a little feeding on the terminals. If you look at the terminals, the new growth, it looks like it's been kind of like a broomed off or brushed off. And that's the feeding of the little larvae. It's inside that terminal. They don't leave the terminal. And if you pick the, the stem off and shake it, they're really hard to dislodge into a bucket. Wait a week or two or three weeks. When they get a little larger, they're easier to dislodge. So therefore, if you're out looking at them, trying to shake uh, uh, stems in a bucket, sometimes you can miscalculate because the little tiny ones are not as easily dislodged to count. Right now, in, in the counts I made uh, last Sunday before all the rain came, it was less than 1% of the fields I was in, in in the central part of the state, less than 1% infestation. And it's just going to get more and more, uh, well, at least if you go by the past history of Kansas and the alfalfa weevil, it's just going to get worse and worse. The infestation, as these eggs hatch, the larvae are going to become uh, uh, heavier and heavier in, into the plants. So what I recommend is don't get too early about spraying. Don't get too excited. Generally, the treatment threshold that I think works best, if you go out and you shake the stems into a little white bucket and you come up with a 30 to 50 percent infestation. So what you do is go out and count 10 stems, shake them in a bucket, and if you got three larvae per 10 stems, that's 30 percent. You got five, that's 50 percent. That's when we recommend you start to treat if you do decide you want to treat with an insecticide. Wait until they get to be about a 30, 33 to 50 percent infestation of larvae. And then look ahead at the weather. If your temperatures are going to be over 50 degrees with no rain, snow, sleet, whatever, for the next 10 days, that's a good time to treat. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lots of times then if you do it that way, you'll get by with one application. A lot of guys think they're going to get out and do it now before it gets to 10% because they get it done early and then they're through with it. But then there's too many eggs. They're still going to hatch. After the reentry interval for whatever insecticide you use, go back into the field and start monitoring again because there can be more eggs that are just hatching out. Timing is of the essence with alfalfa weevil management, as you've instructed us over the years. And Producers, if you'd like to have a look at that stem count method for sampling for alfalfa weevil, your local extension office covers that fully in the publication. It's also online out of K-State Research and Extension. So, Jeff, we are apparently off and running in our crop insect season. We'll be visiting again soon. Thank you. Yes, thank you. My pleasure. Crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth, K-State Research and Extension, a regular guest with us here on Agriculture Today. Burning prairie grass is essential for Flint Hills ranchers. Following grazing and burning best practices can ensure that the prairie remains intact while not smoking out downwind neighbors. The Kansas Flint Hills Smoke Management Plan helps guide prescribed burning on prairie land. To learn more, visit www.ksfire.org. Again, that's www.ksfire.org. Coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and next up, today's agricultural news headlines. These courtesy in part of DTN. 
USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack announced yesterday that the USDA is establishing new programs and efforts to bring financial assistance to farmers, ranchers, and other producers who felt the impact of the pandemic market disruptions. The new initiative is called USDA Pandemic Assistance for Producers, or PAP, and it will reach a broader set of producers, they say, than in previous aid programs. The USDA is dedicating at least $6 billion dollars toward the new programs. Existing programs like the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program will fall within the new initiative and where statutory authority allows will be refined to better address the needs of producers, according to Vilsack. PAP was needed, he says, after a review of previous assistance programs targeting farmers, identifying a number of gaps and disparities in how assistance was distributed, as well as inadequate outreach to underserved producers and smaller and medium operations, says Vilsack. Now, the USDA will reopen sign-up for CFAP 2 for at least 60 days beginning on April the 5th. The Farm Service Agency has committed at least $2.5 million to improve the outreach for CFAP 2. Meantime, the Small Business Administration will likely soon announce an extension for applications to the Paycheck Protection Program after both chambers of Congress voted for the SBA to push the deadline back to at least May the 31st. The Senate voting 92 to 7 yesterday to extend the PPP application deadline after the House voted overwhelmingly last week on that same measure, the bill now heading to President Biden's desk for his signature. At the moment, the deadline Deadline for PPP loan applications is March the 31st, next Wednesday. As of last week, the SBA still had the potential to provide around $110 billion in loans to businesses under the program. Now, in a related move, three senators also announced they had introduced legislation to ensure that farmers and ranchers considered to operate in partnerships are able to use their gross income when applying for PPP loans. The SBA handed down a decision earlier earlier this month that stated that producers in partnership arrangements would have to follow the process used by other business partnerships to apply for the loans, meaning that they would have to use net income, which is significantly lower because of depreciation and other business expense reductions. Now, the senators noted they had tweaked the PPP loan requirements last December to ensure that farmers could use gross income when calculating that loan potential, yet the SBA then returned with a decision on the partnerships that would require the legislation to change. This bill was introduced by Senators Roger Marshall of Kansas, John Hickenlooper of Colorado, and Joni Ernst of Iowa. Yesterday's USDA report on hog and pig numbers had some surprises for analysts. The USDA's Gary Crawford reports. Pork industry analysts may still be staring in disbelief at Thursday's USDA quarterly hogs and pigs report. Yeah, it was a bit of a surprise report. USDA livestock analyst Shale Shagham says all the numbers were not only down from a year ago, but down from what the trade had expected. The breeding inventory down 3% from March 1st a year ago. Market hog numbers down 2 Total inventory down 2%. Producers said they intend to cut farrowings this spring quarter by 3%, the summer quarter by 4 Shagham says there could be a couple of factors at work here. First... Producers have been looking at significantly higher feed prices. So as they began their planning decisions for breeding animals for farrowing in the future periods, they were probably doing it with an eye towards those higher costs. Doing it at a time when prices were down. In fact, Iowa State University says farrow to finish operations were going through several months of negative returns. And that may have been a factor. Prices this month have come up some, so producers could certainly change their minds about how much they want to cut back on production. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Now, breaking out the Kansas numbers from that USDA quarterly, Hogs and Pigs report, the Kansas inventory of all hogs and pigs as of March the 1st was 1.98 million head, down 5% from a year ago and down 3% from the previous quarterly report in December. The breeding hog inventory, 170,000 head, down 6% from a year ago, unchanged from last quarter. Market hog inventory, 1.81 million head, down 5% from last year, down 4% from the last 
quarter. And the December 20 to February 21 Kansas pig crop was at 893,000 head, down 1% from uh, earlier or the year ago, that is. Sows farrowing during the period totaling 85,000 head, down 2% from last year. Now, Kansas hog producers are intending to farrow 84,000 sows during the March to May quarter. That would be down 6% from the actual farrowings during the same period a year ago, with intended farrowings for June-August of this year, 84,000 sows again. That would be down 5% from the actual farrowings during the same period a year ago. What is the current African swine fever situation in China? Again, the USDA's Gary Crawford. When Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack talked with his Chinese counterpart this week, Vilsack asked him about the current African swine fever situation in China. And this is what he told me. He told me that they have it under control. Vilsack said that is what he would expect to hear, and he told farm broadcasters he suspects actually that there are probably some hot spots that are taking place in China. Having said that, he advised me that the Chinese pork prices are coming down which would suggest that they at least are seeing an increase in supply. Now, some of that may be coming from pork they're purchasing, and they are purchasing a lot of pork. Maybe that's the reason why prices have come down for their consumers, but I suspect it's also because a portion of their industry is back online. So Vilsack says he thinks China does not have African swine fever totally under control. But I don't think it's anywhere near as, as devastating as it was perhaps six, nine months ago. This is Gary Crawford reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And lastly, in the agricultural news headlines today, the Department of Justice said that the U.S. Supreme Court should uphold the decision by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit, which said the EPA overstepped its authority when it granted small refinery exemptions to three refiners for the 2016 compliance year. The court ruled that the SREs should have only been made available to those refiners that had continuously received them previously. By providing an initial temporary exemption that can be extended only by specified circumstances, Congress struck a sensible balance, giving small refineries time to develop compliance strategies while maintaining the ultimate goal of universal compliance. That's how the filing read from the DOJ and the EPA. Filings by the Renewable Fuels Association and others echoed that view, saying that the law supports the court decision and that the exemptions siphon a significant portion of renewable fuel blending requirements, as they put it, called for under the renewable fuel standard. The Supreme Court will hear arguments in this case on April the 27th. We'll return shortly to talk Kansas agricultural weather with K-State's Mary Knapp here on Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus. So if you have a fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going in. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Coming your way now on Agriculture Today, the very latest from the Weather Data Library here at Kansas State University. On Kansas Agricultural Weather, Mike's side once more, as usual, is Mary Knapp, climatologist, K-State Research and Extension, and with quite good news, Mary, from the Drought Monitor especially for southwest Kansas. Right. For the first time, we've eliminated extreme drought from the map in Kansas. And in fact, the nearest extreme drought is over on the Colorado side, a little bit further into um, southeastern Colorado. So that has been very welcome. We also trimmed away quite a bit of abnormally dry conditions on the eastern side of the state. Most of central And north-central Kansas is now also drought-free. There is a small pocket in northeast Kansas that has a little bit of lingering dryness in it. But again, we're in a much better position than we were at the start of uh, March. Part of that we've seen with these recent rains has also been reflected in the reduction in wildfire problems. So it's been a very beneficial month. Unfortunately, that's just the start of our rainy season, and we need to have a normal pattern continuing into our spring. And we will talk about whether that's in the cards. Just might note, Kansas was fortunate to escape any severe weather, much as they had in the far southeastern U.S. We did have last week our first tornado of the season. It was in EF0 
in Johnson County, just barely exiting the state into Missouri. But we missed out on the really severe outbreak that they had in the southeast. It serves as a reminder that we are entering severe storm season. It's a chance to go and review your plans, make sure that you have all of your alert systems active and and capable and that your plans are up to date. Well, the moisture, along with the kind of temperatures we'd expect for early spring, have caused those soil temperature levels to remain pretty constantly cooler than planting time preferences. Right. Right now, across the state, most of the soil temperatures are in the 40s. In the northwest, they tend to be in the low 40s. A couple of spots, it's still 39 degrees. If you go to the southeast, where normally the planters get active the earliest, we're still seeing um, soil temperatures in the 46 to 48 degree range. And they are not likely to warm up very quickly. The cloudy weather that we've seen this last week has slowed any warming. And then again, as we know, wet soils are slower to warm even in the best of conditions. So it behooves the producers to pay attention to those soil temperatures and hold off a little bit before you try and get that corn in the ground. It will fare a lot better if we can get it warmed up. And a good opportunity to plug the Soil temperature information that's at the Mesonet website. Right. Go to mesonet.ksu.edu. Under the agricultural option, there is a link to both soil temperature and soil moisture. So you can monitor those conditions and how they're changing as we go through the coming week. Well, to the outlook then, Mary, and immediately we'll see another round of rainfall in Kansas starting perhaps later today. Right. There is still the disturbance that's making its way up that looks like it'll trigger some storms probably late afternoon into the evening hours. Chances vary. Uh, It's kind of hard to tell where they may break out. There is a slight chance that some of those may be on the severe side. So pay attention to (laughs) the alerts that might be coming out with those. After that, um, we're looking at a much drier pattern for the next week. In fact, if we look at the quantitative precip forecast for the week, it favors wetness only along the Kansas-Missouri border, and there they are expecting somewhere around three-quarters of an inch. But as you move west of that line, we're looking at maybe having less than a hundredth of an inch, Mm. so a fairly dry pattern. We would typically expect on a weekly basis to get somewhere between a half an inch in the western part of the state to three quarters of an inch in northeast and as much as an inch and a quarter in the southeast. So, again, we're ramping up. Start of uh, the month in Manhattan, we would expect maybe five hundredths of an inch a day. At the end of March, we would expect to see something on the neighborhood of fifteen hundredths of an inch a day. And to round out that story, temperatures to remain relatively seasonal? We may be slightly on the warmer than normal side. Um, This last week, statewide temperatures averaged a half a degree warmer than Mm. normal. So close to the normal that you you really are hard-pressed to get any closer. Mm. It may be a little bit on the warmer side in the coming week. But then beyond into the month of April, once again, the expectation was for a warmer and drier than normal month. Right. right? The Climate Prediction Center's outlook for the month of April favors warmer than normal statewide. Drier than normal is mainly for the western two-thirds of the state. That eastern portion of the state has equal chances to be wet or dry. And if we carry that out a little bit further for the April, May, June time frame, again, warmer than normal statewide and a chance for drier than normal conditions, mainly in the western half of the state with equal chances on the rest of the state. But to remind once more, that doesn't mean it won't rain 
in the balance of April. Right. And we could be at 99% of normal and that outlook would, would actually verify. We'll have to see how that plays out. We'll talk again next Friday. Until then, Mary, thanks. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks, Eric. Mary Knapp, climatologist, K-State Research and Extension. Her weekly stint on Kansas agricultural weather. And we'd remind you again to take full advantage of all of that good weather information on the Mesonet website, mesonet.ksu.edu. Previewing Monday's broadcast for the cattle market segment, we'll welcome in from the Livestock Marketing Information Center, Caitlin McCulloch, and we'll hear from K-State's A.J. Tarpoff, as we'll discuss with A.J. pre-breeding season vaccination programs for beef cows. That and more on Monday's broadcast. Please rejoin us then. Meantime, a good weekend to you, and thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today. Over K-State Radio Network.